Good evening. Thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. Tonight's webinar focuses on the prosthetically driven all digital implant workflow with PlanMecca Fit. Before I turn it over to Dr. Young, I have a few reminders. There is no live Q&A at the conclusion of this webinar. If you have questions, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive the recording this week via email. This webinar is sponsored by PlanMecca Fit and no CE credits are being offered for viewing or attending this presentation. Dr. Michael Young is our speaker tonight. Dr. Young is a practicing dentist in Michigan and is a member of the American Dental Association, American College of Dentists, and International College of Dentists. Dr. Young, thanks for spending your evening with us. Take it away. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate it. Welcome to Prosthetically Driven All Digital Implant Workflow with Plan Mecca. I'm Dr. Michael Young. Let's get started. So what is Plan Mecca Fit? What does the fit stand for? Is it a fitness craze? Some kind of a workout plan? No, it's fully integrated technology. Scan, plan, design, and create, all working together. Your intraoral scan, your extraoral scan, your 3D image. Designing a crown. Designing a surgical guide. Fitting together to create. Your digital dentistry puzzle. This is my puzzle. The Emerald S scanner, the Plan Mill, the 3D Pro Max, and my Sprint Ray Pro 3D printer. But how does it all work together? What are the brains that make it go? It's the software, it's Romexis. And to me, it's the game changer. It's open and compatible, it can be based on a server, it can be based on a laptop, you can take your scanner from room to room, plug and play, USB, and it all works together seamlessly no matter where you are in the office. So as I said, I'm Dr. Mike Young. This is the University of Michigan Dental School. I graduated in 1994. I have a private practice in Sterling Heights. 26 years goes by in the blink of an eye, let me tell you. And that's me on the left with John Coyce and two of my great friends that I met at the Coyce Center, where I've been a mentor since 2005, and I've met some great people in dentistry. This is April 2018, St. Pete's, Florida, triathlon. If you're claustrophobic, there's nothing like diving in the, in the water and swimming for about 45 minutes where you can't see much beyond your, your hand. But when I do that, I do that to raise money to find a cure for blood cancer. These are my friends. We had a group of about 25 and we raised $156,000 that weekend. And this is my blended family. It's Mike and Cheryl, not Mike and Carol. Three girls, three boys. We call it the party of eight. 
This picture was taken in the summer of 2019, and since then, half of this group is now in college. These are our two dogs. Brody's on the left, Callie's on the right. We're only missing Alice. And this is Sparty. While I'm a U of M alum, I'm a Spartan fan, and Sparty's arguably the best mascot in college. Full disclosure, I'm a member of the Plan Mecca Board of Education, and I'm a Plan Mecca KOL, and Plan Mecca is a sponsor for this webinar, though I'm not being compensated by Plan Mecca this evening. The reality is, I asked if I could help share how the technology makes me a better dentist every day, and it's better for my, my patients, the outcomes are better, and they have better experiences, and that's why I get up in the morning. So where have I been? My digital dentistry experience started in 2004 when I wanted to be minimally invasive with my restorations, and the best way was to mill them in one visit instead of making a provisional that was going to come off because I have minimally invasive preps. So somewhere along the line, the software gets a lot better and the computer can't handle it anymore and you need a new uh, system. So I upgraded to the Blue Cam. When Emacs came out, we bought an oven and we started doing all Emacs restorations. My milling unit had a problem. We repaired the motor for about $6,000. It lasted a while and then we needed to upgrade to the MCXL. And in 2013, I decided to make a switch to E4D. The Nevo scanner was coming out with a laptop and I had the cart for a couple of months before I got the, the laptop. And as a matter of fact, I bought two so that I could take the scanner from one room to the next, plug and play and dovetail my schedule for productivity. There was an issue with the scanner after a couple of years, I think it was a cord and rather than repair it or just replace that, they sent me a brand new scanner, the plan scan at no charge. And in 2015, I upgraded my Promax Pan Ceph that I bought in 2006 to 3D. And at the end of 2017, I made two purchases that really changed my practice. I had no idea just how much it would, but I bought a 3D printer, the Formlabs 2 and the Emerald scanner, which now gave me the ability to do full arch scans uh, with ease and my staff wouldn't give me the stink eye and threaten to throw the computer out the window. And last year, at the end of the year, I upgraded my scanner to the Emerald S. And this scanner, along with the updated software, is unbelievable. Last summer, uh, while I was home and shut down for 10 weeks here in Michigan, I brought my form labs home to do some printing and we ran into some trouble. There was a, a sensor error and I decided to change to the Sprint Ray Pro, and this is the, the printer I'm now using. So this is, like I said, my digital dentistry puzzle. All the pieces fit together. I still have my original E4D mill from 2013, and it's running amazingly well. If you're just getting into the game today, you're probably going to get a Plan Mecca 30S mill, or maybe even the new 50S, which can wet and dry mill and you can use discs or blocks for advanced cat cam dentistry but where are we going what's up with dentistry according to the ada center professional or professional success patients that have insurance are twice as likely to go to the dentist however consumers are being asked to share a larger portion of their premiums and employers are trying to keep costs low and they're putting pressure on dental benefit plans to maintain low cost. And that's being transferred over to lower reimbursements to dentists. So with patients facing an increased share, they are price shopping. And the first question I get when a new patient calls on the phone is, are you in my network? And if you're not, it's a hang up. So on average, dentists participate in about six networks, but the portion, proportion of those now is 80% PPO, and it's on the rise. And in addition, dental benefit plans are trying to push patients to dentists who take their, who are in their network. You just have to read the EOB to know, based on the language that they're using, you would have saved 
blah, 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 if you had been to an in-network dentist. So we have reimbursement falling to PPO levels and they're gonna stay there. And in order to combat that, we have to be efficient, we have to control our costs, and we have to increase our production. Not only that, we have a disruption in dentistry. We have clinics being owned by dentists, going to clinics being owned by corporations that have more buying power, more management experience, the ability to strategically invest, and they have a bigger marketing budget. So you've got some choices. And now we have this. Welcome to 2020. I'm not surprised that more dentists are thinking about selling their practices after what we've been through. This is survey results from the ADA survey for those that responded. They do it every other week. If you look down in the bottom right, the week of November 16th, 33% of those who responded are open and business is as usual. That means about two thirds, it's not. As you can see right here, 65.4% are open, but we have a lower patient volume than usual. Now, if you go all the way up here to April 6th, 80% of dental offices were closed and only seeing emergencies. And 2.9% were open, but lower patient volume than normal. And this is for specialists. You can see that pediatric dentists and perio are doing a little bit better than everybody else, followed by the general dentist. But this is, this is reality. We have lower patient volume than normal. This is the modeling report from the ADA Health Policy Institute. Uh, this report's from June 2020, so I'm not sure how accurate it is at this moment. But at that point, they predicted a possible decline in spending in dentistry by 38% in 2020 and 20% 20 in 2021. So we're feeling the pressure. But maybe, just maybe, this is an opportunity. This is a time to look at how you do things and figure out how you're gonna make it through this and not only survive, but thrive. And for me, I think that's with digital dentistry. It's better for your patient, while at the same time, it's better for your business. We have to be better. We have to provide more at each visit because we're seeing less patients. We have to be more convenient. We have to be more efficient. We have to control our costs and we have to increase our production. My mentor, John Coyce, frequently talks about an entrepreneurial agenda and a healthcare agenda in practice. And how do we balance those? And the entrepreneurial or your business agenda can never take precedence over the care we provide our patients. So he also talks about predictable evidence-based systems that are repeatable. Let's look at those. This study in, 20, in 2004, sorry, they were looking at aesthetics for implant restorations in the anterior maxilla. And what they found that aesthetic failures are caused by inappropriate implant positioning and or improper implant selection. Placement of implants in a correct 3D or three-dimensional position is a key to the aesthetic treatment outcome. How many of you would like to restore this? And how do you handle this when the patient shows back up in your chair with the impression coping? This looks great, right? This is a 2D picture. How many dentists, periodontists, oral surgeon placed this, sent the patient home only having taken this 2D x-ray and they were happy? Whoops, fully guided, not in this case. It was brain guided and a 3D image shows that the implant is not ideally placed three-dimensionally and this is a big problem. Let's look at this study, a randomized controlled study on the accuracy of free-handed pilot drill guided and fully guided implant surgery in partially edentulous patients. What they're measuring is this over here, the apical global deviation. So for freehand, the mean deviation was 2.11 millimeters. 
but the maximum was 4.84. For pilot drill guided, there was some improvement. The mean was 1.43 and the maximum 2.72. For fully guided, it was less than one millimeter and the maximum was 1.98. So when perfect implant positioning is required, fully guided surgery should be considered the gold standard. Furthermore, although every restoration in this study was planned to be screw retained, 19.2% in the freehand group had to receive a cement retained restoration. Results were better for pilot guided as only 4.2 received a cement retained restoration. But this is a key right here for me, 100% of the fully guided placed implants received a screw retained restoration. Let's look at this study by Arisan et al, published in 2013, looking at positioning errors in freehand and computer aided placement implants in edentulous jaws. They placed 353 implants in 54 patients, and they found that interproximal emergence, inner implant distance, and parallelism, parallelism errors were significantly higher in implants Pace placed by freehand. It's not even close. This is a slide I stole from Dr. Wally Renee. Thank you, Wally. I made one little adaptation. It's a no brainer. This study, another randomized clinical trial comparing guided implant surgery with mental navigation or the use of a pilot. Coronal deviation, 1.4 for guided as, as opposed to three for the template. Apical deviation, again, the results are clear. So this study wanted to determine the profiles of patient-based risk assessment and diagnostics of plaque-induced surgically and prosthetically triggered periimplantitis. According to this study, the trigger for periimplantitis was surgical 41% of the time, prosthetic 30, and plaque-induced 29% of the time. What is periimplantitis? It's a site-specific infectious, infectious disease that causes an inflammatory process in soft tissues and bone loss around an osseointegrated implant in function. Periimplantitis can result in bone loss around the implant and eventual loss of the implant. So this is something we want to avoid. This study, the positive relationship between excess cement and periimplant disease, a prospective clinical endoscopic study published in 2009. And the purpose of this study was to explore the relationship between excess dental cement in peri-implant disease using the, using the dental endoscope. And what they found that, that excess dental cement was associated with signs of peri-implant disease in the majority of the cases. Clinical and endoscopic signs were absent in 74% of the test implants after removal of excess cement. Here's another study published in 2017, the impact of resid residual subgingival cement on biological complications around dental implants. This was a systematic review. What they found was residual subgingival cement seems to be strongly associated with peri-implant mucositis, which is a risk factor for increased probing depths, crestal bone loss, and peri-implantitis. This study from Linkovicious, they asked, does residual cement around implant-supported restorations cause peri-implant disease? The objectives were to determine the relationship between patients with a history of periodontitis and development of a cement-related periimplant disease. So the results of the study show periimplantitis occurred 85% of the time if there were cement remnants. For those with a history of periodontal disease, periimplantitis occurred 100% of the time when cement remnants were present. When there was no history of periodontal disease, periimplantitis still occurred 65% of the time when cement was left behind. When there was no history of periodontal disease, periimplantitis still occurred 30% of the time with no presence of cement remnants, which we might expect since we saw the study that said it can also be surgically or plaque induced. And to me, this last graph is the key. No, peri no periodontal history 
only 1% had periimplantitis when there was a screw retained restoration. That seems pretty predictable. So the conclusion that they found was that implants with cement remnants in patients with history of periodontitis may be more likely to develop, to develop periimplantitis compared with patients without history of periodontal infection. So the conclusion, the bottom line for me, if I'm looking for lowering my risk, if I'm looking for predictability, if I'm looking for a system that's efficient, I'm gonna get a three-dimensional position of the implant. That's critical. I want predictability and low risk, get a 3D scan, take an intraoral scan, plan a surgery on a computer, print a 3D surgical guide or 3D print a surgical guide for fully guided placement. And I also want a screw retain restoration that I can cement in my hand and then screw into the abutment. People call this screw mentable. There's other names I've heard tossed about. This eliminates the risk of residual cement. This is a foolproof system more predictable, lower risk. And this is the healthcare agenda. Now, how much sense does that make? What I used to do. Did you see the look on the guy's face? He's waiting for his patient to return. We know that our patients don't take medication as prescribed. What makes you think if you send them to uh, an imaging center that they're going to call right away and make an appointment? You've totally lost control of the case. It's completely inefficient and it costs more. Now, this is the actual cost. Now, this is a few years old and it may be lower today, but I was being charged $125 to, for an online appointment to plan the placement of the implant. The surgical guide cost me $135. They charged me $50 for the sleeve, $25 for a stone model that I didn't really need. They charged me $13 for shipping and tax, $13.38 and a refund for waste of time was zero for a total cost of $361.38. Now, is this good business to send your patients away? It's not a good strategy. So we can do that and send it all away, or maybe we can do it in our office in the same day. And it is possible because I have done it. And this equation here, this is from Dental Intel. Production equals the number of visits times production per visit. And if you have less patients coming in right now, if you have a lower volume, which a lot of us do, you need to have a higher production per visit. And how do we do that? We do it with the Plan Mecca Fit system. Intraoral scanning, 3D, 3D printer, a good implant system, and a milling unit. I'm going to show you an all digital, fully guided in office workflow here. So, if I have a patient in the chair, maybe a new patient, or maybe a patient that we've done an extraction on, and we're talking about doing an implant, and I want to know if we have enough bone, we can just walk down the hallway to the 3D, take a 3D image, and we know in about five minutes whether we have enough bone. And that's, that's what I do. Get the implant lab library icon. Select your implant. Grab your sleeve, hit add to the plan and just put it right in there. So now we know that was pretty obvious. We've got enough bone for that. Now we're going to get an intraoral scan. I'm not going to waste the time 
uh, and take intraoral scans if we don't know if we've got enough bone. So here's our scan for this patient. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna begin with the end in mind. Warren Buffett said, an idiot with a plan can beat a genius without a plan. The final vision, the restoration should be the guide. And here's a short clip about crown design with Plan Cat Easy. We're just gonna draw our margin right there. Hit the plan tab, move it around. Now we're not trying to make this as pretty as possible. That's not the goal here. The goal is to fit it to the occlusion, fit it to the space so that we can place an implant that's gonna function. So now we're gonna merge those together in Romexis. We're gonna click on the fit model icon. Now you're gonna notice in a second, there's gonna be a wizard that pop up. You're gonna scroll down to select your scan. And there's your wizard, step one, choose point one. You're gonna just left click and click on simultaneous points between the two images. And I like to do one on the lingual. And after three, it should snap into place. But I verify the fit and right here, it looks like it's a little bit off. So I'm gonna put another point there. And honestly, I don't know if I even need that or if the automatic matching algorithm is gonna do it for me, but I just do it. You're gonna click use automatic match. Now we're gonna check adaptation and whether it fits and that looks great. Now we're gonna hit fit model again, and now we're gonna fit the crown. Click use existing match and it snaps right into place. I think that looks great. Very easy, very simple on one computer. I literally can do this workflow between 30 and 40 minutes and a lot of it can be delegated. Now let's look at the implant planning now that we've got the models merged together. We're gonna click on the implant library icon and pull up our library. Now I've got the crown there. And our goal, remember, is screw retained. So we want an access opening. And we're in luck because we can respect the bone and the restoration for ideal placement. Now surgical guide design. Also just another module under 3D imaging Simple to use, this can be delegated. Just click the surgical guide icon. And you're gonna set your path of insertion. Now you're gonna 
adjust your printer options, your parameters based on, you're gonna do this a few times with your printer and see if you need to make any adjustments and your sleeve holder parameters. Now, not all manufacturers have their sleeve in the software, but you can find what they are and change them. Now we're gonna preview the guide. Now we're gonna remove some material. So easy. It literally takes longer to export the guide than it does to do the design process. Sign your little agreement, click on the button, export the file. So here is the surgical guide for this patient in place. And there is the implant immediately after placement. Notice a 3D image, I'm not taking a 2D PA. So now we've waited however long you wanna wait and we're ready for a restoration. I'm gonna use the pre-op tab you're gonna remove the healing abutment and you're gonna scan the tissue. You're gonna scan the opposing arch. Your bite. And there's a scan body tab in PlanCAD. So this is a true abutment scan body. And I export those files to the desktop right there while the patient is still there. And I upload them to True Abutment, their web portal. And typically in about a day, maybe two at the most, I get an email with a bunch of images for my approval. I hit approval and they start to manufacture the mill. And the next day I get an email with an STL file for a crown file. Now it's critical to be able to import files. And one of the benefits of Romaxis is the ability to easily import and export files to use any way you want. This is how easy it is to import a file to mill. So I've downloaded it from my Gmail account. I'm gonna show it in a folder. There it is. I'm gonna move it to desktop. Close out of my email. Open Romexis back up, and I'm going to go import CAD CAM STL for milling. Browse to find it on the desktop where I left it. And hit done. And it just pops right up. So there's the custom abutment in place. And here's the restoration. And yes, we could have done some stain and glaze, blended it in a little bit better. There's the access opening filled with composite. So let's go back and remind ourselves of the cost of printing. 300 or the, co the cost of outsourcing, I should say. So this is, a little bit old, but it's a screen grab from Formlabs 2 website. And the only thing that are the only things that are really important are right here. This is estimating the cost of the resin to print a surgical guide. It's a little over five dollars. And for them, they said this the stainless steel sleeve was five dollars and forty cents. My sleeves cost me seven dollars. So that's a total of twelve dollars and thirteen cents as opposed to three hundred and sixty-one dollars. Now 
we're not taking account the cost of the cone beam. Uh, it gets very complicated to, to figure out all those things because I'm going to use the cone beam in everyday diagnosis. So the cone beam gets paid off by the root canals that I get to do, by all the things that I get to do that I would otherwise refer or not do in my office. And the cost of the printer too, we're doing night guards, deprogrammers, models, all kinds of things. So it's hard to distribute that cost. But we're saving $349 each time we do this workflow, which means after 13 times, the software is paid for. So that's a big gap. Now let's look at the restoration. We get our scan body from True Abutment or whatever lab you're going to use. $25, they're autoclavable. They're going to give me a milled titanium custom abutment and crown design file. Like I said, they send me the, the, the crown file. I can actually mill it before the abutment even gets there. Now, you have, your software has to have the ability to be able to import files. And the cost of an Emacs block is about $34 for a total cost of $263. Now, what I was doing, I was sending this to a lab in Michigan. So I was taking an impression, and you've seen all different kinds of average price or cost for an impression, but I'm just going to use $16. We also know that most of the time we need to retake the impression, another $16. It cost me $517 for a custom abutment and a crown for a total of $549. So after the initial purchase, I'm saving of the scan body, I'm saving about $300 per restoration. That's a big difference. So if you don't want to print your guides, or if you want a custom healing abutment to shape tissue, or a custom abutment with a temporary restoration, you can use a hybrid workflow. You can use a laboratory to plan your case if you want, like True Abutment. They have scan bodies for most implant systems for 25 bucks, autoclavable, like I said. They're going to mill your custom abutment and send you the crown file to import. So this case here, I didn't print. This is fully guided, but with a little help from the lab in case you don't want a 3D printer. Now, I want you to notice that this is three shape software. This is what True Abutment uses. The reason why I'm pointing that out is because Plan CAD, Plan Mecha files play nice with other software, and you can send them anywhere you want. So, this is the 3D image that they imported. There's the opposing model. There's the crown design file. All right, now here's the actual 3D image imported into lab software. So they're setting the curve, the mandibular curve there. And here are the files merged, the intraoral scan and the cone beam. Again, green is good. Marking the nerve in this case was not easy. I looked on my image before I sent it and it was very tough. So we did a worst case scenario when we planned this online. There's the surgical guide. And they send you this awesome drilling protocol. And a surgical report. Everything including your bone density down here. And they also send you this PDF file. So you could just print this off if you wanted tape it up behind you, and here's your drilling protocol. So while you may have this memorized, this helps your assistants to, to see what you're doing next. And here's your fixture driver usage. They recommend up to 7.5 with the handpiece and then switching. Now this part here, they're aligning the black and the gold slot of the driver to the notch on the sleeves, which is the timing. And they're recommending to use the path drill for accurate guided surgery. So here is the surgical guide that they printed for me. Notice the notches that are going to line up right here. So this cost $150 which is way better than the $361 we were spending. So here's the surgery.
And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to line this up with this right here. Now, in this case, what we wanted was a custom healing abutment to shape the tissue. And because we did that timing, we can predictably make this at that time and seed it. And there it is in place. You could use this same method if you wanted to make a temporary crown. If you wanted, you could make the final abutment at the same time. And you could also make the crown file at the same time. So this is an older version of Romexis, this screenshot, but this is the implant and the abutment at the time of placement. So when it comes time to restore, as I mentioned, we have a pre-op tab where we remove the healing abutment and we're gonna scan the tissue. That's what it looks like for a stone model. We're gonna scan the scan body, the stone model of the scan body. And here is the custom abutment, which they will send me an email, as I mentioned, asking for approval. And there's the crown in place. So there is the abutment. We seed it. I do take an X-ray. I don't try the crown in it. I, so after this, I take the X-ray. Then I try the crown in, make sure I have, I can seed it all the way. Then I'm going to remove the abutment and seat them together at the same time to make sure it has line of draw. And if it does, then I can literally cement this in my hand. There is zero cement left behind when we do this. So you seat it or we cement it in the hand, we just take a micro brush and put it in the access hole. It removes all the cement that's in the access hole. We seat it, we screw it in place. I put a little PTFE tape, a little blue tape in there, cotton pellet and some composite. And we got a lot of different colors going on there. But what does this cost? Again, $25 for the scan body, 204 for the, the abutment in the crown, 34, $263. So let's look at what this means now. True abutment isn't, obviously isn't the only lab doing this. I've, I've used other labs, but just the lab I used in this case. There's a big difference. And if we're in a pandemic and we're not seeing as many patients, this could be very important. Now this is the cost now went down a little bit because I'm not using the scan body this time. Now, once I have the scan body, the next case for that same implant, I don't need to buy it again. I, I just autoclave it. So this is how you combat the pressure you face. Big, big difference. So this case here, all digital, pilot guided, all done in the office except for the custom abutment and the crown design. This is a, with a dentist implant. And again, I use true abutment. So here's the opposing scan. Here's a scan of the arch. We're gonna put an implant in 19. That bone doesn't look all that great there, right? But here's the designed crown and the fit models. There's the implant in place. The surgical guide has been designed. You can see it here. This is just a screenshot of everything. And there is the pilot guided sleeve and surgical guide. Here it is in the mouth. Osteotomy. placement of the implant and the healing abutment.
Another bonus about doing it this way is that we don't need to make an incision. We know we've got the bone, so there's better, better healing. Here's the implant and the healing abutment right after surgery. In this case, like I said, I used a dentist implant. We just used the simple guide. So one thing I want to point out is that the implant library in Remexis, there's over 100 implant manufacturers. Select the implant library icon. I'm pretty sure you're going to find the implant that you want to use in this library. All included. The guided sleeve is in this one for this implant. Makes things easy. But if for some reason your implant isn't there, you can draw an implant. So bottom line is these digital dentistry puzzles pieces fit together because of the amazing technology and software Romexis as the brains Files can be stored on a laptop or one computer if you want, but the beauty is that it's not on a cart you have to take from room to room. You can put it on a server, which is what I do, and the software can be on a computer in every single room in the office or a laptop if you want. I simply plug the USB cable from the scanner into the computer and use my Emerald S to take a digital impression, and then I can take it to the next room. Now imagine taking it into the room for a new patient and doing a scan on that patient that they can see instead of photographs. I guarantee you they're, they're blown away. I can bring up the cone beam in the room, I can place the implant right in, in, right in front of their eyes in just a matter of about two or three minutes, they can see what we're doing. It builds value. Plan Mecca fits perfectly because it makes for better care, convenience, and results for your patients, and it makes for a better bottom line. And actually, it makes dentistry a lot of fun. I know a lot of dentists worry about the cost of all of this, but in my opinion, you can't afford not to have it, especially right now. It's time to think differently. This is an opportunity. As I mentioned, these are my puzzle pieces. Well, I appreciate the time to show you what I do in my office, show you how the digital dentistry workflow works for the healthcare agenda and how it also helps for my entrepreneurial agenda. Anybody can reach me anytime you want. There's my email, my office number, and my mobile number. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Young, for your presentation. And thanks to all of you for attending. Please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com if you have any questions pertaining to tonight's topic. On behalf of Henry Shine and Plan Mecca, I want to thank you again for attending and hope everyone has a great rest of the evening.